In this, the final and 24th lecture of uh, Particles, Symmetries and Fields, uh, we're going to extend the discussion of induced representations of the Poincaré group to cover massless representations. Um, this will require us to find a different isometry group um, for the little group. Um, and we will end up uh, by demonstrating um, one particular uh, for, for one particular helicity state, but then extending from um, the Lorentz group that uh, elements that are only continuously connected to the identity to the full Lorentz group. In other words, and in particular, where parity is a symmetry. Um, this gives you um, the opposite uh, helicity states as well. At the end, if we have time, I'm going to write a brief epilogue, epilogue as chapter 10, this tells you things we haven't covered, uh, but might reasonably have covered during this course. Um, one of the reasons for not covering them is that actually they're covered in other um, courses in our mathematical tripos. Uh, but also, you know, we've got to stop uh, the course somewhere. And I could have filled it with a lot more applications. But I thought that this course is important for this course to really get the fundamentals down of um, the group theory um, while still showing some very pertinent uh, examples and applications. But of course, the applications haven't been the sole focus. It's really been uh, about getting good foundation. So this is the second case, massless representations. So these, of course, have p squared equal to zero. Um, right, now, in the massive case, we boosted to the rest frame of the particle where the particle has no momentum. We can't do this because we, when, um, we can't do any Lorentz transformation that will take us to the rest frame. Um, of a photon because the photon is traveling at the speed of white light. Um, but we need to prescribe uh, a particular um, p dot mu, a particular form momentum. Um, which satisfies p squared equal to zero. Um, and so then we Lorentz transform to um, other cases with p squared equal to zero. So um, let's just do a Lorentz transformation on our photon. Let's call it a photon for now. Um, our massless particle and say that it's we rotate our axes around until it's traveling purely in the z direction. So then we take p dot mu is some energy which is fixed omega dot times one zero zero one. So it's traveling in the third direction and, and omega dot um, is zero is some fixed arbitrary choice. So to identify the little, little group, we need to know which elements of the Lorentz transformation don't change this p dot mu.
So we lambda solve lambda p dot equal to p dot um, for an inf we're going to do it for an infinitesimal Lorentz transformation. Um, so remember, in our Lorentz transformations, uh, we expanded in terms of these infinitesimal parameters, omega mu nu, um, and the condition becomes that omega mu nu p dot nu is equal to zero. So remember, um, the anti-symmetry of the omegas uh, when either the indices are both upstairs or downstairs. Um, now, all we have to do is uh, solve this for an anti-symmetric um, omega mu nu. So we start off with um, six independent uh, co components of this anti-symmetric matrix. Um, and we the solution you can check for yourselves or look in the book. Omega zero three is zero. Omega zero one is minus omega one three, and omega zero two is minus omega two three. Um, and we also have omega one two as a possible um, parameter. So the six in initial independent parameters by this condition go to three independent ones. Um, and note that um, we have this in the expansion, we have this following term. Um, so getting rid of the zero terms, we can write this out. We go on plus uh, M31 plus omega zero two, M zero two plus M32. So I'm just expanding out the indices and setting some of the terms to zero because I mean, because 03, 0, 03 is 0, for instance. So this is, if you look and identify um, these m's with um, the k's and j's that we introduced before, this is equal to omega 1, 2, j3, plus omega 0, 1. Now, uh, with k1, that generates a boost in the first direction, plus um, j2, plus omega 0, 2, then we have the boost in the second direction minus j1. And we're going to call this combination E1 by definition, and this combination E2 again by definition. Um, and then uh, you can, so we know what the Lie algebra of the Lorentz group. in terms of the k's and j's, so we can work out what it is in terms of the e's. So you can check this for yourselves, it's just one line for each. Um, j3 uh, commutated with e1 gives you e2, j3 with e2 gives you minus e1, and e1 and e2 commute. So this is the Lie algebra um, of the Euclidean group in a plane. So um, we've seen this before actually in an example. Um, here we have one rotation. Um, J3 and two translations E1 and 2. Um, so G P dot is this uh, group. It's actually um, ISO 2, so it's the isometries of a two dimensional plane, um, and it's equal to um, SO2 semi-direct product with T2. So to show this last thing, um, there is an exercise. Um, well, well, we'll get onto this in a minute, but you'll be basically proving this in one of the exercises in the book. So physically, 
the plane is perpendicular to the direction of motion. In other words, it's in the one and two directions and our particles going in the third direction. So um, we define um, an eigenvector of um, E alpha um, to be, so the eigenvector is uh, A1 and A2, um, such that the, so this is going to be an anti Hermitian operator. So acting on a state um, with labels B1 and B2, um, this gives us I B alpha B1, B2, where alpha is in one or two. So um, a unitary operator corresponding to the elements of our little group um, is, we're going to call it O, and it's going to be a function of um, theta and of um, the set of A alpha. Uh, and it's defined to be e to the minus a1 e1 minus a2 e2 minus theta j3. And um, we have that, um, okay, so this is going to be an exercise in the book. It's part of the exercise. If we multiply two of these, together, we get another element of the group where the angles have been added, where um, and where uh, there has been a translation in that way, where I'm going to define these A1 thetas now. Um, they're just rotated A1 and A2s in the 2D plane, A1, A2. Um, so you'll be deriving this, um, see the exercise in the book. Okay, all right, but let's take this for given now. So we put um, theta equal to zero uh, and a1 and a2 prime to zero as well. Um, and just use this result of the closure of the O's. And we get that O of theta zero, zero, acting on O of zero, a1, a2 is um, O of theta, A1 theta, and A2 theta. Now, um, yes, that's good. So this actually, if you think about it, this actually implies the semi-direct product um, of the group structure, the SO2 semi-direct product with um, T2. So anyway, this is consistent with e to the minus theta j3 b1 comma b2 is e to the minus i h theta b1 theta b2 theta. So this linking, so this links all um, B1, B2, with that have constant kind of radius. Because all this theta business does is um, rotate them, it doesn't expand them. So the irreducible representation of um, ISO2 um, is labeled by C and H. 
Um, and this is obviously infinitely dimensional. There's an infinite number of values of theta, for instance. But there is a one-dimensional one representation, one-dimensional irrep with c equal to zero, generated from a vector h. where um, E1 acting on H um, is E2 acting on H, which is zero, and J3 acting on H is IH times the state, which is labeled by H. Uh, and th these are, in fact, uh, so that we need, we want this to be, um, this finite dimensional representation is the one that we want from physical applications. So, for um, applications to representations of the Lorentz group, uh, sorry, of the Poincaré group, e to the theta j3, this corresponds to a subgroup of the SO3 rotations, rotation group. So one parameter subgroup, of course, of course. Subgroup of the SO3 rotation group. Um, so we must require that H is um, either zero, plus or minus a half, plus or minus one, etc. And we might get more constraints on it. Um, the associated Lorentz transformations um, have a general element. Which we can write down. So I'm going to split this up into a bit that does. Um, well, OK, there's a bit. That does the rotation and there's the other bit. Um, and this first part, A1, A2, is, okay, this is a four by four matrix, of course, and it's one plus a half, A1 squared plus A2 squared, A1, A2 minus a half, A1 squared plus A2 squared. A1, A2, half, A1 squared plus A2 squared. Um, now, minus a1, minus a2, 1, minus a half, 1, minus a half, a1 squared plus a2 squared, um, 1, 1, 0, 0. I think these might be minuses, and these are pluses. We need to check that. Um, and lambda theta is just uh, a rotation around the third axis, cos theta minus sine theta, sine theta, cos theta. So um, it's easy to see. that these are Lorentz transformations. So they satisfy the defining relation. In other words, this thing with the lambda transposed times the metric times lambda uh, is equal to the metric. Um, uh, and that if we act on P dot with them, we get P dot. Um, does that make sense here? Yeah.
think, sorry, I think those are pluses there. So the construction of the representation space for P squared equal to zero proceeds similarly um, to the massive case. So neglecting infinite dimensional representations, um, starting from some vector p dot and h, where um, p mu on p dot and h gives us i p dot mu p dot and h uh, and j3 acting on this state of course gives us back i h times p dot and h um, a basis is formed so it's the set of all p and h uh, where p squared is zero and actually p the energy is bigger than or equal to zero. I suppose actually it's strictly as uh, bigger in this case. So this is a basis for VH um, and this is formed um, by acting on some unitary operator which uh, corresponds to Lorentz transformation corresponding to L of P on P dot of H and so we should get P and H so this really defines what L of P is. Um, so this is for, so this is the same as before. So um, we use um, L lambda P to the minus one lambda L P is lambda so we want this to be equal to our element in the little groups this is lambda of a1 a2 lambda theta in our little group uh, and now we consider a1 and a2 um, to be functions of p and lambda and theta also now to be a function of p and lambda um, because they have to satisfy this equation uh, and u of lambda a1 a2 u of lambda theta acting on p dot and h gives us e to the minus i h theta p dot h so then um for any uh proper orthochronous Lorentz transformation, we need to know what the action of uh, the corresponding unitary operator is on VH. So for any lambda in SO3, 1, 3 up arrow, the action of the corresponding unitary operator on VH, um, this is given by the following, U of lambda acting on PH is lambda P comma H, E to the minus I H theta, which is a function of P and, H, P and lambda. So um, putting P mu, big P, well, little p mu. So this is going to be, in general, it's going to be some energy scale now omega. Um, and 
we can it can point in any direction where with uh, omega the energy bigger than zero. And now our general Lorentz transformation is a rotation followed by a boost. So we've seen this boost um, before. This one's going to be in the three direction. We gave it back in section five, and I believe there was an exercise about it. Then um, lambda b, this boost, um, this is equal to um, a half omega over omega dot plus omega dot over omega, zero, zero, a half omega over omega dot minus omega dot over omega, zero, zero. And then we have one step diagonal. Um, so this is a this describes a boost in the third direction. Okay, so we can write for a general rotation. Um, theta n, we can write R, the rotation matrix corresponding to n. Um, well, we can rotate by some angle phi in the third direction, uh, rotate in the second direction by angle theta, and first rotate in, by minus phi in the third direction. And that gives us enough freedom um, to describe any three vector. And angle theta. Okay. Okay. So since um, J three acting on the unitary operator corresponding to our boost acting on our quantum state is equal to H uh, I. I think it's I H uh, times U. Of lambda b. Acting on the state. Uh, so this, along with the fact that u of lambda r n uh, j3 lambda r n to the minus one, um, this is equal to j i r i3. Um, then what we see is that this is equal to um, n dot j. So um, in fact, p hat dot j acting on our general state um, gives us back uh, helicity. So we, we can um, interpret H as the helicity. Uh, and of course, th it, this is the spin in the direction of motion. Okay, so far we've only got one helicity state. Um, that's quite different to the massive case where you know it, the helicity states vary between minus j and j and into just steps.
Um, but we're missing one. There's one more. One more holistic state. Um, we have to take into account that the full Lorentz group consists of the members of um, the proper orthochronous um, Lorentz group plus parity reversal. It also has time as well, of course, but we're interested in the parity ones here. I'm going to call this curly P, um, so, and time reversal. Curly T, but we're not interested in that here. So when parity is a symmetry, uh, and to be open and honest, full disclosure, um, for some interactions it is and for some it isn't. In particular, uh, in quantum electrodynamics it is, in quantum chromodynamics, it is, but in the weak interactions, it is not. But when parity is a symmetry, um, we actually get helicity states uh, plus or minus h. And the reason for that is um, that parity transformations on uh, spin leave the spin operator unchanged. A parity transformation on a boost, well, if you think about a particle going in direction three, and then you do a parity transformation, change the direction of each of X, Y, and Z, and flip them over, um, you're going to get a boost in the opposite direction. So um, it's minus K. Um, and, uh, but the parity, well, so if, if parity is a symmetry, it doesn't change the Hamiltonian. energy operator um, but of course just uh, by the same token as boosts parity will change the direction of the momentum um, so this is three momentum uh, let me in fact let me make that clear by putting an eye there um, but we're interested in what happens to the helicity and that's the eigenvalue of p dot j divided by the mod of p. Okay, um, but what's if you apply the above rules, you see that you get a minus sign for the helicity. So, in other words, uh, parity, the state which is the parity transformed p and h, has helicity minus h. So what this means is that um, parity acting on P and H really gives us some complex phase because it's we're allowed a phase in uh, quantum mechanics and an observable phase. So this is a complex phase times the state with the negative helicity. So um, photons have helicity plus or minus one. There's no um, helicity zero state like there would be for a massive spin one vector boson. Gravitons, as I mentioned before, have plus or helicity plus or minus two. Um, it was originally thought that the neutrino was massless. That all neutrinos were massless. Um, so let's call them, well, they're new E, new mu, and new tau. It was thought that these uh, were massless originally at the conception of the standard model. Um, and that they maximally violated P. So violated the parity symmetry. Thank <laughs> you. 
um, because um, only helicity, only one helicity state uh, was observed. No one saw the plus half helicity state and still haven't. So if you want more details on this, it's fascinating, um, see the standard model course. I'm going to have to come and enroll on part three and do it. I recommend you do that. Part three is an amazing course. You, you need a good first, though, a, a very high first to enroll. Um, OK. Now, um, there's just one last bit to mention, and that's to calculate the Casimir. Um, W1 acting on our state. Well, if you put it, if you substitute in for W1, you'll see that this comes out proportional to E2, um, which has a zero eigenvalue. By similar arguments, W2 also gives you zero. Um, W0 gives minus W dot H, V dot H. Uh, W3 gives minus W dot um, H, P dot H. So what that means is W mu plus uh, H times P mu on P dot and zero is naught. Or in other words, W mu, W mu um, is equal to minus W squared. Uh, w dot squared h squared acting on this state. So we can see that um, the helicity uh, is part of the Casimir, and so different helicities um, label different states. Good. So now I've just got one last job to do, and that's to start in the last chapter, which won't last long, I promise. Um, the epilogue. So I just want to answer for you what we haven't covered that we might have done. Um, right, first one, Nertus theorem. This is, this is a more quantum theoretic uh, thing. So in a, oh, actually not necessarily quantum, but in a field theory in general, um, there's a conserved current along with every charge. So for every symmetry, you get a conserved charge and current in a field theory. Uh, and it works in classical field theories too, and there's a quantum version of the. Um, so this is typically covered in the quantum field theory course if you're doing part three of the mathematical tripos. Spontaneous symmetry breaking, this is an important to topic. Um, it's an application that's taken further uh, between quantum field theory and, and our symmetries. This describes um, how symmetries in quantum field theory can be broken spontaneously by the vacuum state. Um, and in fact, um, this is uh, what leads to the Higgs mechanism, gives particles mass. So it gives, uh, for example, gauge bosons can acquire their mass this way. Gives some particles mass, some fundamental particles mass. Okay, this is typically covered in our standard model course. Um, okay, the standard model course. <laughs> All right, so this is a theory built on a gauge symmetry. 
So this is quantum field theory built on SU3 color cross SU2, which only acts on left-handed part fermions, left-handed particles, times a certain U1 hypercharge gauge symmetry. Um, plus, uh, well, between 45 and 48, let's say 48 um, vial fermions. I've included right-handed neutrinos here because we know neutrinos have mass. Uh, and uh, a, Higgs a Higgs doublet of SU2, a, a, a complex, I should say, a complex Higgs scalar doublet field. Um, describes all known, known forces, all known fundamental forces. except for gravity. And gravity is a quantum gravity is an unsolved problem in research. Supersymmetry. This is a really new kind of symmetry. Um, it's its own course in, the, in part three of the mathematical tripos at Cambridge. Um, here, this is when um, it's, an, it's really a new kind of external symmetry where fermions are rotated into bosons. Um, it's got the, it's got the uh, potential to answer some mysteries of the standard model. And the real mystery is why is the Higgs boson so light and stable towards quantum corrections? Um, and it's also got theoretical importance as a crucial ingredient in superstring theory uh, and for um, more understanding of Yang Mills theory and confinement, uh, one can add more supersymmetry and um, to the stage where you can actually solve the quantum field theory, at least to some degree in some meaning. Um, the, the, the applications of supersymmetry to particle physics have um, waned in popularity in recent years, mainly because the Large Hadron Collider hasn't found um, particles that are extra particles that are predicted by the theory of supersymmetry. Um, but uh, anyway, it doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means it's less people are working on it right now. Um, a fifth topic is integration over group manifolds. This will typically be touched upon in the advanced, what we call the advanced quantum field theory course. Um, quantum field theory is so huge, we should really change its name to just quantum field theory too, because there's, there's a lot more, uh, a lot more advanced quantum theory, um, field theory. Six, um, anomalies, quantum field theory anomalies. So see AQFT to touch on this typically, and, and, and anomalies are also covered in advanced quantum field theory in the part three of the mathematical um, tripos. These are theories which are have a symmetry at the classical level of a field. So the field, the classical field theory has a symmetry. but where quantum corrections spoil them. So it's an interesting um, topic, um, which has been looked at quite a lot recently, actually. And uh, the last topic that sometimes people wish I cover that um, come to this course, and it's usually the people who have been to a previous master's course before doing ours, is something called Young Tableau. Young Tableau is really a mnemonic for um, what happens when you take the direct product of representations for the decomposition of um, direct products of reps uh, into a direct sum, okay? So, um, if, for example, uh, you can 
use the rules of this mnemonic to derive three plus uh, cross three is um, eight plus one in SU3, for instance. Now, I haven't taught this. What I've taught you instead is how to represent um, this uh, product in terms of operators, field operators in the Lagrangian. Um, and actually, you, you can derive this by not having to learn some mnemonic. And the problem is the mnemonic is typically um, taught for SUN, but there's a totally different mnemonic for SON, and there's a different one again for SPN. Um, and the, the other groups don't have a mnemonic, whereas the techniques I've taught you should work for any of them. So um, it's something that, um, you know, if you end up doing a lot of these tensor products, you might want to look it up because um, it's a nice way of checking uh, what you're doing. But they, the techniques that we use have more generality than Young Tableau. So thank you very much. Um, I hope that you have got something out of this course and that you've enjoyed it. Um, and I very much hope to be seeing you later in your career as um, a PhD student and then as a postdoc. Bye-bye.